All right, guys, welcome to chemistry lesson 4.04, orbits versus orbitals. <coughs> because orbits are what Bohr came up with. But what we're going to find out is that electrons were much more complicated and frankly, a little sketchier than what anyone could have imagined. Let's go ahead and do a recap of what we've got so far and who figured it out. So we started out, we had Rutherford. We talked about him a couple of videos ago. Uh, Rutherford, and he was in about 1880. And he discovered protons in the nucleus. Discovered protons in the nucleus. And we've got J.J. Thompson. He was around this time, 1880s, 1890s, so about the same time. And he discovered the existence of the electrons. He's given credit for that. <coughs> Nobody could figure out where they were until Bohr came along. So Niels Bohr. And I think he was about 1910-ish. And he came up with a theory of atomic orbits. Sometimes Bohr's model is called the um, billiard ball. The billiard ball um, model. And it's kind of what you learn when you're in elementary school. So what Bohr said was, let's go over this again. So if I've got a nucleus. Around that nucleus, I have fixed distances called orbits. And electrons, I'm going to make my electrons purple. The electrons orbit, so he said electrons orbit the nucleus, fixed distances. He called those uh, orbits, which made sense. And he also said, or uh, basically, electrons are like tiny marbles, pool balls, planets, whatever you want to think of. But we're talking about particles. <clears throat> well, here's the thing about particles. Uh, anything. So uh, if, if I'm on... Um, Earth and I want to know where Venus is at. If I have a set of physical equations, equations from physics, I should be able to calculate exactly where Venus is at. And it doesn't matter if you're the size of an electron or if you're the size of Venus, you should be able to do that. So if I'm standing in the nucleus and I want to know where this electron is, if I have my equations, uh, and I want to know 10 seconds from now where that electron would be, and I calculate it should be here. But then I look, I have a problem if it's not where it's supposed to be. And this was happening over and over and over. So there was an issue. The electrons were not behaving. like particles should because we couldn't tell where they weren't showing up where they were supposed to be well the first guy to kind of uh uh um tackle this problem was named heisenberg if you've watched uh, breaking bat whoops heisenberg uh, you know what? I'm going to wipe this out. There should be, well, there should be an N here. Heisenberg. <laughs> if you watch the series Breaking Bad, you'll know that Walter White takes on the um, alias Heisenberg, uh, which is named after uh, the man who created the Heisenberg. Uh, and he named his principle the uncertainty principle. And the Heisenberg uncertainty principle says that uh, it is not possible to know an electron's 
location, and speed. Which is a little bit weird because to us that's like, okay, so what is my spelling issue today? Lactation? Seriously? That one I'm fixing. L-O-C-A-T-I-O-N. So we can't know both its location and its speed. Well, if you're a particle, you have to. So basically what Heisenberg's uncertainty principle was saying was electrons aren't particles. Well, okay. If they're not particles, then what are they? Well, enter scientist number, what are we up to? Number five. So this is scientist one, two, three, four, number five. His name was De Broglie. De Broglie. And his theory was called the wave particle duality theory. wave particle duality theory. And it said that basically electrons could flip back and forth from being a particle to being a wave. All right, that doesn't probably turn you on your head because we're talking about electrons, but I want you to imagine if you could behave the way an electron does, when you're in particle form, you're visible, you can be seen, you have mass. When you're in wave form, it would be as if you disappear. So it would be as if uh, uh, I was sitting at the front of the class and then I disappeared and I reappeared at the back of the class and then I disappeared and I reappeared on top of one of the lab benches and then I disappeared and I reappeared laying on the floor at the other side of the room. You guys would flip your lid. Well, that's what electrons do. They behave as both. And one of the things we do when we're in class is we talk about doing the uh, electron dance. So when you're doing this, that's wave. When you're doing this, it's particle. So we say electrons are a wave, they're a particle. They're a wave, they're a particle. They're a wave, they're a particle. Uh, works better in person. Um, and there were some scientists that absolutely hated this. Einstein hated this theory because he wanted, he didn't want to believe that you could not find exactly where an electron was. Well, that was the implication was that you could never know exactly where they are. They were not orbiting the nucleus like these tiny little pool balls. They were kind of blinking in and out of existence. All right, here we go with scientist number six, Schrodinger. And this is all during the 20s and the 30s. It was a huge time for particle physics. We were learning so much. And if you think about it, that was only 100 years ago. This stuff really hasn't been known for very long. So let's illustrate what Schrodinger talked about. Imagine that uh, we were going to go to an arcade. And I'm going to draw an arcade game here. Uh, you guys ever play whack-a-mole? This is my big old hammer. So when we play whack-a-mole, you have to hit the mole. Stand. That's not too bad. I'm going to grab the brown marker. So every so often, you'll get a mole that pops up, and you have to hit it on the head. Here's my mole. I'm just making my brown dot. So you got to take your mallet and whap. You got to hit him on the head. And the trick is to try to figure out where the mole is going to appear. Now, you can't tell exactly where the mole is going to appear. But if I took, if I was standing beside you and I took a marker or a pen, and I put a red dot every time a mole showed up, my dots are going to show up like this. Let me pick something a little large. These are a little darker. Mm, we do pink. Do a marker. So every time that mole pops up, this one's a little far over. So 
So what I'm doing now is I'm pretending like this is you're you're playing whack-a-mole and I'm marking every time I see a mole. So in a sense, Schroeder did this mathematically with electrons and he created what's called a probability map. So this is what I just made is a probability map. And it shows me likely locations of something happening. In this case, we were looking at whack-a-mole and we could see that, well, sure enough, my probability corresponds to where the mole could show up. So I can say, I don't know exactly where the mole is going to show up next, but I can say with almost 100% um, certainty that the mole's not gonna be here, or it's not gonna be here, or it's not gonna be here. <clears throat> Schrodinger did this mathematically with electrons and he came up with an equation called the Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation creates a series of three dimensional probability maps. Three D probability maps <laughs> that tell us the likely location. They tell us where the electrons can probably be found. Probably, and that's the key word. Because if something's blinking in and out of particle state, we don't know where it's going to show up but we can know where it's probably going to be. His first, so we have a series of probably, let's see, we've got, uh, I should know exactly how many. We've got one, four, uh, 11, about 20, I think 22, 23 different shapes of probability maps. But the first one, so the probability map for the one electron in hydrogen. And what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be drawing 3D uh, axes a lot. So to draw a 3D axis, you want to draw a really narrow X like this. And you want to draw one down centrally. So this becomes your X, this becomes your Y, and when we go 3D, we call that the Z. So that's a 3D axis. So when you apply the Schrodinger equation to a 3D map, if I started to mark where I see that electron show up, so, and, and the center is my nucleus, let me say that. Let me get red. So the center is the nucleus. That electron begins to show up in a very fixed pattern. Now notice every time I, I put my marker down, that's the electron disappearing and reappearing. And because it's probability every so often, it might jump out somewhere where we don't expect it to be. But for the most part, that electron always shows up in a spherical region. And this is a sphere, so I don't know how to do a 3D sphere. So the first map is a sphere around the nucleus. Now, Schrodinger realized you couldn't call these orbits anymore. We don't have pool balls going around uh, orbiting like planets around the sun. So he said, uh, let's call these regions, these probability regions. And that was just showing that. So let's, he said, let's call these probability regions orbitals. And this is the definition, a 3D probability map that tells us where electrons can probably be found. 
But considering we started back in uh, 1890, this has been a long journey. So we're up to about what, 19, now Schrodinger uh, and de Broglie, they were the 20s, 30s. We're looking at about 50 years to figure this out. Um, and probably into the 40s too. Uh, physics kind of got sidetracked in the um, 30s and 40s because of um, working on nuclear weapons. But this is the reality. These guys are blinking in and out of, out of existence. And we can't know exactly where they are, but we can know probably where they are. And so we spend the rest of this chapter describing orbitals and uh, understanding um, how that relates to the way that electrons behave and because of electrons, the way that elements themselves behave. So it has big implications. It's why we're taking so long developing this. All right, that's everything for this orbits versus orbitals. Yeah, thanks for watching.